wonderful hymn of worship, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, as we join together. I'm going to invite Dave Holton to come and make an announcement. I guess I'm allowed to partially take off my mask. <laughs> As Glenda said, if you don't like the mask, there's doctors that wear it for three to eight hours. <laughs> anyway, it has been, oh, brothers and sisters, it has been four months since we last had a service here at First Baptist Church. But that does not mean that the Lord has not been with us. This is the best sight I have seen in four months. Amen. Amen. Okay? <laughs> this is the best sight since we had to uh, lock down. It is great to be in fellowship again, but we still need to be prudent with each other since we do not know when a situation might arise from us breaking the rules. We have put our trust in God. Now let us show our love to each other as we show each other that trust. On behalf of all the leadership in this church, welcome back and God bless you all. <laughs> I hope you know that what we are doing is the best of our ability to serve all of you as a church. Psalm 122 is a psalm of David, and he says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And this was my joy this week as I thought about it. Now, the context of this psalm is very specific, and it is amazing. It's a song of ascents. And it's David, as he says in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within the gates of Jerusalem, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel. Now this decree was given in Exodus 23, and it was all the feasts of God's people. And they were commanded to gather together all the tribes of Israel would come up to Jerusalem. And as they would ascend the mount, uh, the temple mount to worship God, King David said, I had joy. I had joy in this, this corporate sense that we are coming together to worship God. We are in this place. And those of you who are joining us by live stream, the purpose is given in these verses. In Psalm 122, it says, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, to worship God. I thought about the Jews in captivity. It says they wept by the rivers of Babylon. It says they refused to sing. They could not bear to sing the songs of Zion because they longed to be together, to worship God at the temple in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was the same. When he heard that Jerusalem was in ruins, he sat down and he wept. David was the same. He was in the wilderness. And we'll look at a verse in a bit, but, but he longed to worship God together with the people of God. And I want to say along with Dave, that in these days my heart is glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. That we are together to worship. In the weeks leading up to this Sunday, I really believe God put this on my heart, that this service, this entire service, I'm going to be preaching on worship. We want to consider worship. We want to focus on worship. And the words you see on the screen are the very words of Jesus. He said in Matthew 15, in vain do they worship. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That in this time when we are waiting just for a little bit before we sing, 
that we remember that it's our hearts that are, are drawn to worship. So in these days, I want to invite you to consider worship that we would have our hearts renewed. Uh, I'm going to invite Dawn to come in a moment. Let me sit down first, and then Dawn is going to come and sing this song. And I pray that it will be a call to worship to every one of us, that though our lips are silent, that our hearts would be singing praise to God, that he would hear our praise. So listen and worship with me. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, let this be true of our very hearts. We simply come. Would you draw us into the heart of worship, redirect our focus, be pleased with the praise and, and the joy that is flowing from our hearts, our love for you. You are the king of endless worth. We can't even express. But in the silence of our lips, 
Fill our hearts with praise. Hear our prayers, Lord. You are our God and we are your people. Be pleased with our offering of worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I was thinking, how are we going to worship if we can't sing? So I took a hymnal and I wrote in my hymnal, believe it or not. There's none in your, in your pews, so you can't do the same. I made a note, July 19th, 2020. This is a historic day. After being apart, we are coming together. This will likely be a new normal in our worship. I look forward to the day that we can sing together. And I put the first service back together, my office hymnal. And if you have a hymnal at home, I would encourage you to do this. I, I think that there will be a day when we sing. There will be a day when this church is filled with praise, glorifying God together. But in the meantime, our hearts can be prepared. I want to begin with something that maybe is going to be a little strange, but I think it will help us in the long run. What is the most well-known hymn of all time? Amazing Grace. You know how old that hymn is? It was written by John Newton in 1772, 248 years ago. We should celebrate the 250. Like, I, I think this is amazing. It's the most well-known hymn, but as I thought about it this week, I thought maybe we can take a little bit of time and let our hearts be drawn deeper because sometimes I think we sing the words without considering what they mean. So listen to this. You know these words. You don't even need it on the screen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Have you ever thought about that? You ever thought about why is the sound so sweet that I know I'm a wretch? <laughs> how could it be that I could say that's a sweet song sound? The world keeps telling us, no, everybody's basically good. But for the humble, penitent worshiper of God, it is a sweet sound. And you know what I thought of this week? I actually have been thinking about it a few weeks, and I told a few people at our prayer meeting. But I thought about the story of the woman who comes to Jesus. She falls at Jesus' feet. She is wetting his feet with her tears, and she's wiping his feet with her hair. And it says she actually kissed Jesus' feet. And then the Pharisees, they look at him and they go, well, if this was the prophet of God, this is in Luke 7, this, this explanation. If he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner, a wretch. And you know what Jesus says? The one who is forgiven much loves much. I pray that we never sing this song the same again. I pray that when we come to worship in a few months, a few weeks, and we sing Amazing Grace, your heart will be drawn back to this. This is a sweet, beautiful sound. You know how it continues. I once was lost, but now I'm found. A sheep that is all alone in a dangerous precipice, afraid for their life, lost. And a shepherd who calls their name and comes and rescues and finds them was blind, but now I see my heart quickly ran to John chapter 9, the man who was born blind. And when the Pharisees accused him and saying Jesus was a sinner, the man says, I don't know, but one thing I do know is I was blind and now I see. Do you know it? The song goes on, "'Tis grace that brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home." Where does your heart go with that line? The Apostle Paul said, "'I am what I am by the grace of God. His grace to me was not without effect. Do you know the grace of God? When we sing this song in a few weeks, that we would worship and say his grace is sufficient. 
I hope that what this will do for us is that as Brent plays this song and as the words are on the screen, that you will worship in silence with a full heart. Will you worship with me? Sisters, it is really good to see your faces. We're going to do a responsive reading out of the Psalms. And for those who aren't familiar, uh, that will just mean that some of you will repeat after me and some of you will repeat after Pastor Dave. Um, the Psalms are a song book or a prayer book of Israel. We have our hymn books and in ancient Israel they had the Psalms. And this is the book they went to. And when you go to the end of the book of Psalms, there's many different themes that run through the different books, or the different uh, psalms, sorry. And um, you have lots of songs of lament. In fact, about a third of the psalms have at least some aspect of lament to them. Uh, there are songs of praise, there are songs of all sorts. When you get to the last five in the book, they all start and end the same way. Bless, or praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So all the last five of them, they begin and end with that refrain. And so we're not going to go through all the last five of the songs, but we're going to take Psalm 146 and then Psalm 150. And so if you were on this side of the church, you were going to follow Pastor Dave. 
And if you are on this side, you will follow after me. And Lemps, you will just have to decide which portion that you belong on there. So you're right in the middle. I'm sorry, we should have warned you. <laughs> there we go. You've made your minds excellent. Let's worship the Lord as we say his word together. And so you should see this on the screen. So let's start. Uh, I will be the one with uh, not bolded. So let's begin. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the Together. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Now let's do this with Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. And all together, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. in a time of prayer. And the um, focus that we want to pray about is our Lord Himself. Again, as Pastor Norm said, our theme is worship. No greater theme than looking to our God to worship Him for who He said He is. So would you join me as we pray and consider Him our King and our Lord.
not a place, but rather a person. You have said that eternal life is to know your Father and to know yourself. There is no greater task that we can set ourselves to than to know you and love you, the living God. Yet, Lord, we confess that we were blind to you. We were born not loving you, not giving thanks to you. We were born with hearts loving in everything but you and your steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, nothing came more natural to us than to hide from your presence and to cover ourselves with fig leaves of our own making. How gracious you are to call us out, to open our eyes, to behold your beauty, and to incline our hearts to your testimonies, to send your spirit to breathe new life into our lifeless souls. Thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in your holy book. And this morning we desire to worship you with lips that declare your name. Help us to understand and know you, O oh Lord, even as we declare these truths about you. That you are the Lord who is greater than all you have made. You are transcendent. You are in the heavens and you do whatever you please. Help us, oh God, to be in awe that you are other than us. Infinitely greater. Even when all of the splendor and glory of the nations are placed beside we are as nothing and emptiness. We are as a drop from a bucket. Yet, in mystery beyond mysteries, you are imminent. You are close and involved in your world. You are not only know every star by name, but how many hairs are on our heads. You lead with power and might. And yet, you gently carry us as lambs in your arms. Who is like you, O oh Lord? You are the Lord who is omniscient. You are all-knowing. You know when we sit and when we rise up. You know our thoughts and words even before we know them ourselves. You know all of our ways. Nothing is hidden or mysterious or secret from you, O oh God. You are the Lord who is omnipresent. Your presence is everywhere. Where can we run from your presence, O oh Lord? If we go to the heaven, you are there, even as you are in Sheol. Even the darkness we run to that we think hides us is as light to you. You are the Lord who is omnipotent. You are able to do anything consistent with your nature. Power belongs to you. Nothing is too hard for you. You even formed us and knit us together while we were in our mother's womb. Our frame was not hidden from you, even as every cell and strand of DNA did what you designed it to do in giving us life. Every one of our days was known to you, even before we lived it. You formed every one of our days. And you are the Lord of love. In your all-knowingness, your everywhere presence, and your unlimited power, you saw fit to look upon the sinful state of your people, our helplessness to save ourselves, 
our ungodliness that permeates every aspect of our lives, our sinfulness that defined us from birth. You looked upon your enemies and ordained it to save for yourself a people for your own possession. You sent us the law to expose our inability to obey. And you sent your only begotten Son who willingly came to pay the penalty that we owe for our sin against you and live the perfect life that we cannot live so that we might know you and thus know eternal life. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to give us understanding of these glorious truths and so much more. Oh Lord, we could spend all day talking about how glorious and beautiful and wonderful you are. Help us to recognize how ignorant we are. And may that kindle in our hearts a desire to know you to taste and see that you are good. Help us to love and behold your beauty and your glory. We pray that you would answer this with more than we could ask or even imagine. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Worship the King, all glorious above. Gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Frail children of dust and as feeble as frail. In thee, Lord, do we trust, and we've never found you to fail. Your mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Thank you, Brent. Isn't it great to have Brent back on the piano? God has made us to worship. We're commanded to sing. In Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, it says we are to sing to one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs and to make melody in our hearts to the Lord. That as we sing, we are preaching the gospel to one another. Because it's to sing to one another and to the Lord. But in these days, as we wait, I pray that this morning your heart was drawn into worship as you consider the Lord. Jesus' words in Matthew 15 call us to true worship. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship. You know what that word vain means? It means empty. Jesus is saying that it is possible to sing every single Sunday. To have our lips filled with all kinds of messages and melodies and 
our hearts to be empty. Now this is both sobering and encouraging. (laughs) Because in these days, our lips are not speaking. (laughs) It's sobering. And believe me, as I was honest before God, and, and I had to honestly say, Lord, test my heart as I looked at these scriptures, I can truthfully say it was a bit of a exposing of my heart, describing of my own heart. Have you ever found yourself just going through the motions of worship? Can you be honest enough to say that, that you've sung those songs and, and before you know it, the song is over, you haven't thought about even one word? I hate to confess it, but it has been true in my heart. And God in his kindness takes and draws us back. And this is the encouragement of these words. It is an encouragement because it's calling us out of empty, out of external only, to true worship of our hearts. If you worship something, you value it. You have placed it with ultimate worth. It is something that you have placed as your highest treasure. When we worship God, we are treasuring him above all. We can see God as he is and our hearts are filled with love and adoration. It is not empty worship. It is hearts that are full and And they're filled with this revelation of God and our love and we cherish and treasure him above all. We are satisfied with him. And our love and adoration is then expressed through our mouths. We're commanded to use our mouths. I love these verses. Just listen in Psalm 63. Here's King David. And the title of the psalm is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Most likely this is the time of Absalom's rebellion in 2 Samuel 15. David's life is threatened. But he doesn't pray for deliverance. He doesn't pray pray for God's victory over his enemy. You know what he prays for? It's a psalm of worship. For God himself, that's the desire of his heart. I want to invite you into that today. Our very first service as we come back together is a call to worship. Listen to David. In the wilderness, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. Now how is that possible? He already is his God, but he is still seeking him. My soul thirsts for you. Do you hear what this is? This is not just mouths declaring it. It's a soul that is truly engaged. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory because your steadfast love is better than life. And you know what? His life is threatened. But out of his heart that is filled is this recognition that God's steadfast love is better than life. And you know what the very next line is? My lips will praise you. Wow. Now that is worship. That is this wonderful sense that that our hearts are filled with this, this experience of God, this knowledge of God, that he is our God and we continue to seek him, our souls thirst, and out of that, it comes out of our lips, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. I wanna invite you to pray with me and then we'll quickly consider what is true worship. Will you join me? Father, thank you for this service. Thank you that in the quietness of this space and in the thoughtfulness of of humble, honest hearts, you call out praise of your people. The Psalms tell us that you inhabit the praise of your people. That you sit enthroned above the praise of your people. We are commanded to worship you with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and And to make melody in our hearts to you, Father, fill up our hearts with this very same worship. Will you open our eyes to see you in your word? 
Will you open our ears to hear and speak, Lord? For your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. As I thought about the fact that we wouldn't be singing for a while, I was honestly confronted with this thought about how will we worship? In our first service when we gather, how will we worship? In fact, I heard other pastors actually say the same thing. One pastor said to me, we're not starting again until we can worship. And I thought, yeah, that makes great sense. But then I was struck by the thought that what he meant was we're not starting again until we can sing. And I know it's hard and I can feel that same desire, but, but I hope that as you sat here today, that though we did not sing, that you worshiped. That's why this morning I want to preach on worship. My desire is that over these weeks and months, that we will have a bit of a reset. That we'll begin to say, what does it mean in my own life to worship God? And also, what will it mean for our First Baptist Church worship services? That we will not just sing and listen to great music, although I can hardly wait till we do that, but that God will raise up in us as his people a, a true heart of worship. That's why we gather. That's why we are together with God's people. Now I want to say simply this, that the foundation of all worship is simply this. Listen carefully. True worship begins with a revelation of God. It does not begin with music. It does not begin with church attendance. True worship is the revelation of God. And, and when it comes and shines the light of the reality of who God is over the heart of a human heart, it produces worship. That's why the Bible is so important to us. That's why at First Baptist Church, every Sunday you come, we will be preaching God's word. We want to reveal God to us. The foundation of worship, true worship, begins with the revelation of God. It does not begin with all these other things, though these other things are an expression of worship. And so what we ought to ask is, what is worship to God? What does God want in our worship? Not, what do I want in worship? Not what kind of music, what kind of situation, what do I want in worship? We should ask, what does God want in worship? And what kind of worship is God seeking? That's why we ended up in John chapter 4. Look at verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers, which is an incredible description, revealing that there are false worshipers, but the true worshipers will worship the Father, in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So whatever is going on here in John 4, God is declaring to us, this is what I want in worship. Amazing! The Father is seeking such people to worship him. And the immediate question is, will we be those people? God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So the kind of worshipers the Father's seeking must worship this way. It's not an option. It's not up to you to decide how you want to worship. No, it's if we will worship God, this is what he desires. We must worship in spirit and truth. Now, the context of these verses is the woman at the well. Go back to verse 20. We know the story. Jesus has just revealed everything about this woman's life, and then the whole passage spins and turns. And the rest of this passage is to reveal everything about Jesus' life. Who is he? In fact, look, look back at verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is speaking to you, 
The entire point of this passage is the revelation of the Messiah. That's how it ends. But Jesus, the woman, somehow it gets a little uncomfortable. God reveals the truth of her life. So then what does she do? She kind of changes the subject about a question on worship. And, and I thought, oh yeah, she's just trying to avoid the truth of her own life. But I do not believe this is a mistake. I believe this is the very reason it is here in John chapter 4 in the gospel. That God in his sovereignty, his providence, was moving this towards worship. Because it's a revelation of who Jesus is. Look what he says. She says in verse 20, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that it, in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. What is she focused on? The place of worship. And what does Jesus say to her? Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. What does Jesus focus on? Who we are to worship. And it's really important that he says the time is coming. And then Jesus says in verse 22, this odd little statement in And I didn't see it as clear as I did until this week. You worship what you do not know. See, Jesus is still focusing on the object of their worship, the object of their affection. It's not just where, it's what you are worshiping. Jesus says you worship what you do not know. But they know God. We worship what we know. And here's Jesus' substantiation. Here's his explanation. How, what is it that Jesus knows? For salvation is from the Jews. Who is Jesus talking about? He is the salvation from the Jews. Then he is saying, if you will worship according to how the Father is seeking worshipers, that you must worship me. That's what Jesus is saying in these verses. In fact, though I don't have time to go into this, I believe Jesus is declaring that we must worship God as he is, as a trinity. We don't just take these verses in John and say, oh yes, let's worship in spirit and truth. That means we should have spiritual worship. It should be somehow an expression of our own spirits. No, this passage is about the spirit of God. Do you see it? In verse 24, God is spirit. How dare we take this passage and say, no, it's my spiritual freedom. I can dance. I can use tambourines and ribbons and whatever I want. It's a spiritual experience. Jesus is not defining how. The Psalms tell us to dance, which is really hard for us Baptists. We can hardly clap, right? I'm with you. I have a Mennonite background. You do not want to watch me dance. So we are called to be fully engaged in worship, but not here. Don't misuse this passage. And I know this is true because this week I was so humbled that he is talking about God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. In chapter 7, in the same gospel, in John's gospel, chapter 7, Jesus picks up this very same idea of living water. Verse 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, what is that? Look at the next verse. This he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not glorified. He is saying this living water is the spirit. He does the very same thing when he says you must worship in spirit and truth. We know this in the gospel of John. In chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The true and living way. And he does the exact same thing in John chapter 8. 
Jesus said to the Jews in verse 31, John 8, 31, he said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you say, okay, Pastor Norm, that's just, I know the gospel. And, and when I know the truth, it'll set me free. And so many of us have misused this passage. And I myself have often misused this passage. I was so humbled this week. Look at verse 36. What is the truth? He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The truth is Jesus. In fact, that's the entire message of John chapter four. If you knew who it was, you would ask and he would give you the living water. He would give you the spirit. And the father is seeking those who will worship him as Trinity, as father, spirit, and son. You must worship in spirit and truth. And though you may not agree or somehow still struggle with this, whatever you say, it says God is spirit. We must worship God as he is. The woman says, I know the Messiah is coming. Now, just before that, look back at verse 23. Jesus had said to the woman, the hour is coming when you will neither worship in either of these places, but you will worship God. The time is coming, the hour is coming. Then in 23, the hour is coming and is now here. This is now the time when you will worship God. God is spirit. And the truth is Christ the son. And the woman says to him, I know the Messiah is coming. She doesn't understand that this is the time when Messiah has come. Who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. He will reveal the truth. And Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. My dear friends, the kind of worship that the Father seeks is not just our melodies but the foundation of all worship begins with the revelation of God. And as we gather as God's people, we humble ourselves under God's spoken words. That as God speaks and reveals himself to us, as we see him and know him, we will worship. Authentic worship is to worship God as he is. I think what Jesus is doing with the Samaritan woman is he inv is inviting her to be a true worshiper. My dear friends, for those of you who are here this morning, those who are joining us by live stream in the same Invitation, I invite you to be a true worshiper of God as he is, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. You see, this is the difference between me being in my office. I wanted to do that very intentional. I, I brought the camera close and, and I wrote on my notes, I wanted to show you how to study the Bible and to see, wow, it's right there, it's right there, it's true. That is teaching. I wanted you to be close to look into my eyes in my office. But in preaching, the reason we come to church and we gather as God's people, in preaching, there's a call to worship God together. We must gather. We are the people of God. There's a little more than 200 verses that actually use the word worship. There's too many verses in the Bible to count that actually describe God and actually do worship God. And as I read all of these 200 verses this week, I saw there's three main 
ways or aspects of worship, and I will just mention them. We don't have time. The first is that in worship we are seeking God. It's the largest category, and it's a warning against going after or seeking idols, going after and seeking false worship. In Deuteronomy 8, it says, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. It is this idea of going after and seeking them. In Jeremiah 1.16, I will pronounce judgment on my people for their wickedness of forsaking me, burning incense to other gods and worship what their hands have made. The idea of worshiping idols is anything in our lives that we cherish and takes the place in our hearts above God. True worship is aligned with this function of seeking God. In 1 Chronicles 16, it's talking about worship and the context is singing. But he says in worship that we are also to tell of all God's wondrous acts, glory in his name. Let the hearts of all who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his faith, face always. Psalm 27, David in worship, your face, Lord, I will seek. Psalm 42, longing after God in worship as the deer pants for the water. My soul longs after you, O God. My soul thirsts. Where can I go to meet God? Remember the procession to the house of the Lord? This is all Psalm 42. Hope in God. Seek after him. Psalm 84. My soul yearns for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out, not just for the courts of the Lord, not just to be in church, but my my heart and flesh cry out for the living God himself. This is King David in Psalm 63. And the obvious first question of worship is, do we seek God or our own experience? Is he the object of our affection and and the center of our greatest cherished treasure? Maybe you're here today or you're joining us by live stream. I, I want to invite you that if the desire of your heart is to know God and like the woman at the well, you are thirsty and empty and longing for more and you are done with just saying the words in an empty heart, then the first primary aspect of worship is to seek God, and I call you to it. The second main function of worship is to exalt God, to see him as he is, to give him the rightful place over our lives and all our affections. In Psalm 69, there are these beautiful words. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will worship him. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull or horns or hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. It's both seeking God and exalting God. In 2 Chronicles 7, verse 3, they bow down to the ground in worship and they give thanks to God. He is good. His love endures forever. We humble ourselves as we lift up and exalt God. It's, it's everywhere in the Old Testament. In 1 Chronicles, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. In Psalm 99, exalt the Lord. Psalm 21, be exalted in your strength. In Psalm 46, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Some of you know these verses. 
Here's the invitation. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us, let us exalt his name together. The first aspect of worship is to seek God and to know him as he really is. It's based on the revelation of who he is. The second is to exalt him when we see him, when we know who he is. By his revelation, we lift him up. We give him the first place in our life. Infinite value. We recognize his worth, that he is worthy. And he alone has all our attention and our praise of all of our lives. And that is the third aspect of worship. There is a close connection throughout the entire Bible of two ideas. It is to worship and to serve. In the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not worship and serve them. Now, there are many that make a really great distinction between those two things that worship and service are different, but, but it's all through the Bible that they're put together. When Jesus is tempted by Satan, he says, just worship me and I'll give you the nations. You know what Jesus says to him? You shall worship and serve God alone. It's all the way through the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 11, 17, 29, 30. It's worshiping and serving. In Romans chapter 1, it says, Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. So we are called to worship and serve the Lord. In fact, I believe they're inseparable that, that we will serve the very idol that we worship. If it is our own sexuality, if it is our own ability to amass fortunes and wealth, and if it is our own pleasures and, and the things that our hearts truly love, we will serve those idols. And it's all the way through the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says that whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In Colossians 3, it says the peace will, of Christ will rule your hearts. The word of Christ will dwell in you richly. And whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, that's the motivation. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Our lives, we worship and serve. I'm studying the book of Hebrews on my own these days and just couldn't sleep one night. And, and I woke up and I read the entire book of Hebrews, about two hours and I came to these words on worship. In chapter 12, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship. This is the kind of worship God is seeking. With reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And, and I just barely got over that and, and just... This wonderful sense, oh Lord, help me to offer this to you. And then I get to chapter 13 in Hebrews. And it says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. In that verse, it is the fruit of lips and it is the action of our lives. Both of them. Verse 15 begins with sacrifice. Verse 16 ends with sacrifice. Continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. What is it? That is the fruit of lips acknowledging 
the name. It is, it is this verbal recognition and declaration of what is truly in our hearts. But then verse 16 And do not neglect to do good and share what you have for this sacrifice. It's our lips and our life. My dear friends, this sermon is a simple call to worship. And in God's kindness, he humbled me and calls my heart to this. And I invite you. Join with me in worship over these days. Whether we sing or not, that it will come out of hearts that are filled with the knowledge of God. That we will seek God, we will exalt God, and we will serve God with all our lives. I pray that this is a new day for First Baptist Church. And for you and I. Will you pray with me? Father, you know the prayers that are on every heart. At the end of the service, I pray as the pastor, but but ultimately the response time is each one in this room. Hear now the prayers of your people.
be seated. Let's just take a moment. It's been so great that we can be together. I'm grateful for those who could join us, even by video. I'm thankful to God for all this technology we've had over these months, that God has still taught us and encouraged our hearts in his word. I'm thankful that you are growing in your personal time with the Lord. We just wanna encourage you as you feel comfortable to join us every Sunday morning. Our official first time together is gonna be on August the 2nd. And we will share communion together. We'll give you instructions um, on that Sunday, next Sunday likely. But as we worship God together, may God seal to your hearts the commitments you made this morning. May you find encouragement and great joy that we are his people, whether we are at home or we're together, that we worship him with all our heart and our soul and our mind. We wanna dismiss you this morning. I know what happened to me when Brent started to play the doxology. Didn't you feel like you're supposed to stand up? This is like stand up time. <laughs> we do have offering uh, boxes on your way out. We're gonna ask everybody on the main floor to exit through this door. It's one of the protocols that our provincial health has asked us to do. They've asked us to have a separate exit from entrance. If anybody does need to use the elevator just for the sake of uh, stairs are difficult or uh, wheelchair walk or whatever, then we wanna dismiss you first. Um, and then we will just have the rest of us will go out these side doors. It's marked all the way along. Please, please do out of respect for one another, still observe the distance. Uh, and just, you know, we can do it like you're at a, a church potluck. You know how you let certain tables go at a time? Just, you decide, just we'll start on this side and we'll go it this way. Uh, but there will be an offering box that you can put your money in. It's locked and there will be an usher there. If you're in the balcony, we're going to ask you to leave out that back door. Go down the stairs and out, out the front door of the church. I want to thank you as a church family for sacrificing. For sacrificing to wear a mask, even though you think this is ridiculous. Some of us. And others feel like this is important. I want to thank you for being careful to express love to one another out of putting aside your own 
freedoms for the benefit and care of others. So may God bless you as we walk with him. As Brent plays, you're free to go. We'll start on this side and then we'll go from the top. Thank you.